All right, well, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Stacy Potter. I am with uh, WeaveWorks. I'm a community manager here at WeaveWorks. And today we are presenting hands-on GitOps patterns for Helm users with Scott Rigby, my teammate, developer experience engineer here at WeaveWorks. Um, and this is yet another uh, GitOps Days 2021 or 2021 community special. Uh, you'll notice that we have changed the slides because GitOpsDays.com has officially been announced. So June 9th and 10th, uh, we're hosting GitOps Days. So you can uh, register and check out the CFP if you have a great talk that's GitOps relevant. Um, please submit a CFP uh, for us. Uh, you can go to www.GitOpsDays.com to register and to uh, submit your CFP from there as well. Uh, another conference which we are WeaveWorks is uh, co-sponsoring uh, at KubeCon uh, this May on what is it May third, Scott? That's oh yeah, it's right there on the on the slide. So May third, uh, a colo event with KubeCon is GitOpsCon. They're also doing a CFP right now. Both are open, so submit your talk to both both conferences, and uh, hopefully you'll get picked for for one or both. Um, so yeah, if you go to the KubeCon site and click on um, the GitOpsCon CFP. It'll take you to this page where you can fill that out. So we've been doing these sessions every two weeks or so for the past few months. Um, and really this is with Flux V2 being in development and getting ready to go GA kind of anytime in the near future. Now we don't know when it's going to happen, but in the next, I would say six months at some point, I would think. <laughs> um, don't hold me to that. I know that's not a firm date. Um, you know, we're trying to get people prepared for, for that move. So if you've been hearing about Flux2 and you're thinking about switching over, now is definitely the time. Um, and we've been, you know, trying to give everyone some tutorials, walk them through the guides with these sessions in particular. So a quick note on how to get connected to the Flux community. Um, please check out the Flux docs. There, there's a link here. Um, GitHub discussions have a, a breadth of knowledge, a wealth of knowledge there um, on all kinds of things, uh, but especially Q&A um, and all kinds of, you know, stuff that the community is really um, active uh, on or ideas about. So please check that out. And then, of course, you can always reach everyone in the CNCF Slack channel flux. So WeaveWorks is the company that Scott and I work for. Um, we have a lot of open source projects. Hopefully that's how you know us if you've heard of us before. And um, Flux is now an incubating project. I don't think that was announced on our last session. So hooray, we have made it into incubation. Um, and Flagger as part of uh, Flux now is also uh, under that Flux umbrella in the CNCF now. So if you want to check out any of our open source projects, uh, you can check them out on our GitHub pages in the CNCF or on our website at weave.works. Please check those out. And um, we're, of course, using Zoom. And these sessions are typically running about 45 minutes to an hour. I'm assuming this one will go the full hour, but we do have a hard stop at the top of the hour. So we will cut it off at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, which is at 11 p.m. Pacific. Um, and I do apologize. I realized today that I accidentally put the wrong time when I was posting all over the place promoting this event. So hopefully if you're joining us in GMT, you got the update note. Um, so if you have questions at any time, please do use the chat panel uh, and type those in and we will get to them when um, Scott has a break in the presentation or at the end, actually. Would uh, would you prefer that, Scott, at the end? That way you can breeze through, unless something's really relevant. That's a good question. I think if someone has a question that's relevant to um, to what I'm asking about, go ahead and post it. Um, okay. I wouldn't mind if someone wants to flag me down and I can get sure. to it. And if, if I can't easily, I'll, I'll save it for the end. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just type those into the chat panel. So if you're brand new to GitOps, we just want to give you a very basic, what is GitOps uh, brief overview here. So as the name indicates, it's Git plus Ops. Um, sometimes we like to say it's operations by pull request, where you have a repo as your single source of truth. 
Um, it's not just app dev or just operations, but really a methodology that crosses all areas. We talk about GitOpsing all of the things and the business value that comes with that are reliability, velocity, and security benefits. Uh, it's also a paradigm or a methodology. It's not one single tool or technology. Of course, we're very excited about our Flux project and we worked really hard to get it to the place where we've brought GitOps value, but we're thinking about the vision of the most powerful way we can think about GitOps in the coming years and hopefully decades. And we really do feel that if even if you're not using Kubernetes, you can still do group, uh, GitOps. But if you are using Kubernetes, it really is part of that evolution of Kubernetes, um, leveraging the Kubernetes API and what that brings and is really the next stage of uh, and way of leveraging the benefits of that technology. And we're excited to be a part of that community in a very deep way. So the principles of GitOps, I'll run through these very quickly. Um, not everybody has all four principles. So really anywhere you start is a great way to get started on your journey. Uh, whether you're using Git as your versioning system or not, uh, the important thing is that you're using a versioning system. Other core principles are that you have a declarative system and that you have a way in which those changes are automatically applied to the system. And then at the end, you have ways of having reconciliation and ensuring that you have correctness and alerts with that. So that is a very quick and dirty principles of GitOps bare bones edition in this slide. Uh, if you wanna learn more, you can check out our YouTube channel. We have some, uh, some great what is GitOps basic um, sessions, maybe even from the previous GitOps days of last year. So with that, I am done with my quick intro and Scott, I will stop sharing and hand it over to you. Great. All right. Um, one second here. Just wanted to add a little note to my secret gist or my gist. Okay, great. Um, hey everyone. Um, so I'm Scott Rigby. Uh, well, I guess you just got the intro, but uh, Flux. are you sharing your screen yet? Uh, I am not. Okay. I suppose I should. Yeah, let me do it now. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm. I'm a. I'm a Helm community, or sorry, a Flux community maintainer and a Helm um, project and org maintainer. So nice to meet you all. Let me see if I get this screen shared. Okay. Can you all see it okay? Oops. Looks good. Incorrectly. Sorry about oh, I think that. It, yeah, you screwed, Just screwed one second desktop. here. <laughs> Just one second here. Yeah, there we so go. you got to see my messy desktop for a second. Great. So, uh, so yes, um, that's me and welcome. And I'm going to try to be pretty paced about this because there's a lot of info to cover, um, but I hope it helps. Please just let me know. Uh, please be interactive about this. So in the, uh, we don't have breakout rooms or anything like that, but please just, you know, let me know if there's something that you'd like me to cover a little bit more in depth or a question about it, like I said before, um, or if, uh, literally, there's any feedback you have, and I'll try to take it as I go. Um, okay, so we'll be what I'm planning to cover is just you know why we're even talking about Helm patterns for Flux. Um, <clears throat> we do have demos out there already, a, a good number of them, um, by members of the DX team, and they show you how to do various things, including things related to Helm. Um, there's a there's a really wonderful uh, there's a really wonderful um, repo that Stefan made that uh, <clears throat> one of the Flux maintainers who where it shows a, a really good but relatively complex setup of using Helm and customize um, in order to do a lot of cool things. Um, this talk is going to be focused primarily on uh, on just Helm for people that don't necessarily are in the mode right now to learn another tool like Customize or to do other um, complex things in their repo and want to just start out lift and shift style. So um, that's why um, I'm gonna, uh, then we're gonna talk about how to move Helm releases from your CI to C Flex CD. Um, some common use cases, pitfalls, and just a bit of how the Flux controllers work to make all of that happen. Um, I'll do just a little bit of, de a little demo um and uh a little wrap up and thanks so then we'll have we'll have q a after that that sounds good okay so 
Um, so, so first I'm gonna cover, uh, in order to guide you through some of this, I'm going to show a little bit about Helm and Flux's scope to make it clear why, what Flux does in addition to Helm for, your, for, for what you're trying to do now already with Helm. Um, so, you know, Helm 3 is now just a client in SDK. Um, that was part of the design for Helm 3. Um, and Helm provides the SDK for other tools to make best use of its internal functionality. And this is what Flux does. Um, it is, um, I'll just go over the what's in scope and what's not first. So uh, Helm does, you know, as a client in SDK, that's, that's literally its, its scope now. It does packaging, it does configuration. Um, you know, it, it, in itself, it, it does app delivery that's imperative um, in the sense that, I'm sure you all probably know what that means, but in the sense that you're running commands and those commands do something to a cluster. Um, it handles versioning and rollback and, and a lot of the other, uh, all the features that you know of in Helm. And what's specifically out of scoop that I wanted to pinpoint that Flux uh, helps to, and other tools in their own way, but Flux, uh, the Flux Helm controller addresses um, is uh, managing, Helm doesn't manage or structure multiple environments at all. It just, that's completely out of its intended scope. Um, you have to use other tools for this, whether you're, if you're a Helm file user, it has environment options. Um, many, many people have something like a bash make file set up in their CI um, to, to, to aid in this kind of thing. Um, uh, there's, uh, Helm does, specifically doesn't have any control loop. Uh, that's, by, that's by design. Um, it doesn't have any retry logic, also by design. Um, the, the, the idea is that you're supposed to have other tools that, that call the Helm client or SDK and do this on your own. Um, it doesn't, Helm uh, does not have automated responses beyond um, setting up the roll, rollback with atomic flag and things like that. Um, and as I said before, there's no retry with that if something fails. Um, Helm also does not do any automated drift detection. So imperatively you can run, and a lot of, I'm sure many of you do in your CI systems um, or just by hand, um, you can use the Helm diff plugin to see what Helm believes the difference is uh, in your, uh, on your cluster um, and what you have written in your, in your files that you're trying to deploy. Um, so I just wanted to note that as far as the SDK goes, Flux is the, uh, as far as I know, the only CD tool that purely uses Helm's SDK, you know, no shelling out to a binary or everything and doesn't fork Helm to do that. So th what this means is we contribute upstream so everyone gets the benefits and not only um, not only the Flux team or Flux users, but, but everyone as well. And um, you know, for me, this is what open source is all about. So we try to do that. Um, the Helm controller scope, uh, I, I noted, I kind of hinted that it covers those, th those specific things I pinpointed that are not in Helm scope, but, um, uh, oh, I do have a diagram here, but I'll have to get to that later. <laughs> See the diagram later. Uh, so Flux, just to be really clear, for those who don't know, it's a pull first CD system, a continuous delivery system. Um, I, I want to note you can also add push webhooks, um, but uh, really ultimately the pull model is where it's at. Um, you can do them both in combination. So for example, you'll have a pull, you'll have flux polling uh, regularly looking at what your source says you want to happen in your cluster with your Helm releases and your Helm repos and so on. Um, and uh, when, <clears throat> excuse me, when there's any, any, any uh, drift detected, it will go ahead and apply those. I'll cover it more in depth when I get into the diagram, but I just wanted to note that here already with when I'm speaking of pulling, pull first, if you also set up webhooks, you can have faster reconciliation attempts when you make changes in your repo. Um, it's just that the idea is that, you know, uh, many of you may have uh, come across this, but sometimes web, web hooks fail. Uh, sometimes the network fails, lots of things fail. So that's why, that's why we do the reconciliation that um, Stacy mentioned at the beginning in the GitOps principles. So what Helm controller does as well, uh, its scope primarily is it separates CD continuous delivery from continuous integration. So 
many of you, I know uh, I certainly have uh, at points, uh, many points in the past, um, use, C, uh, use CI to also do my CD. Um, this is probably the most common use case. So what, what the Helm, Flux Helm controller does is it moves Helm releases to a continuous deliver, delivery reconciliation loop rather than some imperative event-based job, uh, you know, either through you know, Jenkins, through GitHub Actions, through whatever else. Um, <clears throat> it also removes the need for a human uh, response to a CI job. Um, you'll still be notified when there's a runtime error, and then you can uh, you can address this. Um, and your first response under under uh, GitOps will be to fix it and see fix it in, in your source in your in Git or your other source repos, um, rather than to pause the entire system, go in and try to put out fires and, and so on. Um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to note that. <laughs> Some people are like, well, are you trying to automate my job away? And of course not, of course not. You know, like save, like use your time for more creative and problem solving work that only humans can do. This is what we all hope to do. That's why we automate things. And this just helps to take that a step further from separating CI from CP. Um, so I had mentioned uh, Helm controller uses the Helm SDK. Um, uh, it doesn't do Helm template and just sort of apply, uh, kube control apply, it doesn't do that. And so you still get all the benefits of, uh, that you're used to, and you can still use Helm exactly in the way you want to in terms of inspecting the repo. You can still use the Helm diff plugin locally to see what's, what the differences are between what you think you want to push uh, to, to get and so on. Um, but, uh, but the rest of the system handles that for you. Um, I, I also wanted to know Flux Helm release object uh, defined by the cont Helm controller supports hooks um, and post-release Helm test. So those are some other really nice ways that you can separate certain pieces from CI and CD. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, <laughs> so just just a, in summary for this tiny little thing, uh, you know, tiny thing. But it, anyway. Uh, Flux really introduces uh, more reliability, consistency, observability, like I had mentioned, and also auditability um, over what you normally do with Helm. And auditability in the sense that these are your changes are stored in version control. So, uh, yeah, so moving um, Helm releases from CI to CD, um, some of the most, I mean, just looking at some common use cases. Uh, there are much more, many more in-depth ones, and we can cover those in later talks. But um, uh, you can either go ahead and do this in place, lift and shift style, or lift and shift and pivot to GitOps, or you can migrate your Helm releases one at a time to fresh infra. Some people are in that mood already, and they want to migrate, and so they're looking at um, GitOps as kind of part of their new tooling for the new system, and you can do you can do both or one or the other on a per um, on a per release basis and per cluster basis. So for example, you can do it per release uh, in dev, you can do it per release in stage. Uh, you can do um, you can just do the full move one at a time in any of those um, combinations. So and it's also important to note that you can mix and match your custom helm charts and shared um, community charts as well or, or internal shared charts as well. Um, probably the same patterns you already use. So what, what you can do, these are just some simple steps. Um, this is not exactly a demo, but it's pretty close, this piece of it. Um, you can, ref, uh, if you want to configure Flux to, to own existing releases, lift and shift style, um, you can just, um, First, you want to just see what kinds of values you already have stored in your version control. Sometimes there's uh, sometimes there's a difference, <laughs> as you all as you all know. So um, you can just simply um, check those files, and then uh, you know whether again depending on your CI systems whether these files have some scripting, um, like for example, you know environment name dash values um, or if you have you know a series of descending 
uh, values files that you apply an order, um, or if you have, or like I said, if you have Helm file for some version of declarative um, uh, configuration, then you can look at those values in there um, and, and, and configurations in there. Then you also want to inspect the state of your cluster to see if there's a difference um, you know, between what you have in code and what you have running in your cluster. Depending, uh, you know, I mean, I know this never happens, but often, you know, this does happen. So, you know, this this is really important if you have a collaborative environment where develop, some developers at times are modifying releases imperatively, just just doing the thing using the Helm client with, directly to the cluster. Um, so you just do a Helm get values, and just uh, make sure to know which you want to keep. Then you can go ahead and configure um, Flux Helm release with your Helm values. So um, I can show you uh, what in, in, a, in a bit what the Helm release values look like. Um, uh, sorry, the Helm release object looks like. It has a values uh, section and also a section that's values from. Um, there's good docs on this for, for Flux. And you can either store those in config maps or secrets in values from. That's really nice if you want reusability. So yeah, so some of the other um, you know, benefits you might have seen versions of these in past talks. I'm going to fly over them kind of quickly-ish, but um, it's important to note that that the Flux Helm controller allows you to pause and resume reconciliation per release. Um, I think that's fairly critical for a lot of DevOps folks because something about GitOps is a little scary sometimes when you're when you're just trying to figure out how how and if and when to uh, to move on to that because, um, well, well, if there's some machine doing this for you, like, you know, like basically what I'm saying is there's a break glass. Um, and it's not just a break glass for the entire system like it was in Flux 1 where you have to pause all reconciliation for all things uh, in the same cluster. But you can just go ahead and pause a specific release, which is nice. That's important if when you're first, after your first step of trying to fix something in Git, um, there's still something wrong and you don't really see what's going on. Uh, triage style, you can just pause it, get in there, do what you need to do, um, and, uh, and then re resume when you're ready. Um, so another really important feature is, um, is, is the Helm controllers depends on feature. Some people may need this much more than others. So if you have um, large umbrella charts, which is a recommendation from Helm um, when using Helm alone, you can. This takes up an extraordinary amount of memory. So if you basically your charts, all of your charts depend, all of your charts dependencies, um, and everything gets read into memory multiple times in order to build up what uh, what needs to happen for a release. Um, this is by design in the Helm client and, uh, and SDK as well. Um, but what, what the Flux depends on feature allows you to do is use separate Helm release definitions that are, uh, excuse me, Helm release um, custom resources that are defined by the, um, the Helm controller uh, and specify that they, they depend on one another. And the Helm controller will ensure that they're that they are installed in order. That's pretty important. Um, here, like example use case I had mentioned right here is, you know, ingress controller and cert manager are often installed before other applications that rely on these. Um, so that's those are kind of if those are installed by charts, then then uh, then you can use the depends on feature for that. Um, so just quickly wanted to mention this feature of Simver range policies for charts. Um, this is fairly important, and this is covered elsewhere. But just uh, just to get it on your radar, um, this helped. This can be helpful with the image automation feature um, <clears throat> in Flux, and it allows you to have good policies for ranges. Uh, you may not know uh, that you can install charts from a storage bucket as well. So uh, the Flux source controller has three different sources currently, um, a, Git, a Git repo, a, uh, 
a Helm repo or a storage bucket, like, uh, you know, S3, S3 compatible storage bucket. Um, do not try this with a KFC bucket, please. Uh, oh, well, ultimately, here's an example use case. Um, if you really saving money and look for latency, that's an example use case for buckets. So if you have multi-region clusters, for example, and uh, you set up storage buckets co-located co with each bucket, you're not hairpinning every time you're able to save on costs that way. And some systems actually, some systems, uh, if you're using them, you know, but some systems require, um, uh, re require re reading configuration from storage buckets. So we support that. And, uh, and you don't have to, you really don't have to, um, here's another thing, there's lots of areas of reusability. This is just one example where, um, you know, you've got a Helm repo, let's just say something like the Prometheus community Helm repo um, that has 17 different charts in it. If you're using four or five of those, you don't have to define those on every Helm release. You, we, we use references, so you define once use everywhere. And uh, another really important thing that I won't get into in depth right now, but just so you know when you're considering moving to GitOps with Flux is that you can have optional credentials per Helm repo. This is very important and, um, and we can cover it more in depth later, but this is, uh, it's, it's good for talking about the patterns. Uh, I just wanna make one note on this it, for the purpose of this talk is when we're looking at GitOps patterns for Helm, um, there are different ways to do it. Generally, um, you, your, your repos are probably already, hopefully anyway, set up to match the privileges that your teams are supposed to have and match your organizational structure. So we, this includes multiple Git repos. And so I wanted to point, pinpoint this, point out this feature uh, that you can lock them down in different ways. <clears throat> to enforce the principle of least privilege. And uh, this is just a note to look at for later. This is not exactly a feature of Helm, but it's just a cool, excuse me, a feature of Flux, but it's a cool thing that, um, that Flux is doing. And it also relates to Helm releases. So uh, you can use, when, if you're using cluster API, say to set up, a, have a management cluster to set up other clusters, you can, you can specify Helm releases to be in different clusters. So you don't, you don't have to do that within the same cluster. Um, so that can be very helpful when you're thinking about setting up your um, privilege patterns as well. For example, you have application teams that have access to one cluster, but you have, um, or rather uh, you have people that are able to work on other resources in the cluster with your application, such as front end developers and so on, but you have the releases themselves managed from another cluster in production. Okay, so uh, this slide has got a lot of text on it, but uh, I'll simplify it later, but it is all valuable and I'll make the link to this uh, available after this talk. But here are just a few of the pitfalls that you run into when moving your, your existing CI from, uh, sorry, your existing Helm releases from CI to GitOps is if you've got custom logic, for example, this is a very common use case in your CI system, like you're doing health checks and you do things step by step. Uh, this is when you've got portions of your CD mixed into an another CI system. Um, you'll just, you'll, when moving to Flux, you'll have to determine how to port that logic to a Flux compatible solution. And what I mean by that is that Flux does not, for security reasons, and this is a good thing, does not allow arbitrary binaries, uh, Flux2 anyway, to be run in the cluster. That's, that's fairly critical. And I, I, I hope for security-minded folks out there, you agree with that design decision. Um, so it also helps to keep things very clean. But it also means that if you've got like random scripts that run at different times uh, within existing CI pipelines, that you may find this challenging. And if it does prove challenging to separate the CI and CD out, it might be a sign that your current CI and CD are overly coupled. And that hopefully will help you uh, see where those cases are and help to, um, help to think about how to separate them a little bit better. Um, because it's not just 
a problem for flux uh, when they're over, when CI and CD is, are overly coupled, um, as those who have that set up like that now know, it can cause other problems intermittently. Um, <clears throat> so good thing. Um, and so one way to solve this is just more cleanly separate your CI and CD. Um, and in the example that I mentioned about having health checks set up in this, you may want to consider other tools that are more resilient to set this up than jobs which may, CI jobs which may fail um, uh, to accomplish these same goals. For example, Flagger does traffic directing based on health checks and other conditions. So the nice thing about this is it can open you up to other future, path, future uh, um, goals that you may have of blue-green testing, canary, uh, blue-green deployments, canary deployments, and so on based on these kinds of conditions. Um, or help to simplify those if you have other systems set up and they don't really play already with your CI. So um, the other really common pitfall that I wanted to mention real quick is it is definitely possible to accidentally structure your repos such that it's hard for people on your team or teams to access things that they need to do. So um, for example, um, if you want, like I've mentioned before, that great break glass scenario where people can update their Helm releases during incident response. Um, you know, whether we're talking about in the Git repo or as I mentioned with the break glass, um, allowing them just imperative cluster access to, to temporarily uh, pause reconciliation and, and make changes until they, they get the solution that they then put back into Git and then resume reconciliation. Um, it's really important to make sure that the structure of your repo and directories within a repo or repos and directories within them um, follow uh, follow your organizational structure and what you want people to be able to do. Um, so you may already have um, you may already have things like that set up uh, separate repos, but if you don't, this is a great time to consider it. Um, whether it's splitting into multiple or just giving per directory access. And um, an example is the GitHub co code owners file or um, GitLab's ACLs. Okay, so I wanted to mention briefly just how flux source and health controllers work. There's documentation on this. In fact, this diagram that Stefan made is in the flux documentation. So, um, there's no need for me to go over this like a lot, but I wanted you to understand what the what the Helm controller does and how these play together. So, in short, uh, can you see my mouse, Stacy? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> in then you've probably seen me frenetically pointing to things. Uh, okay, so these on the right here are our example uh, sources. Um, GitHub, Chart Center, um, et cetera. And those are sources for, for your charts, but also for your other manifests and so on that you need. Um, the, the Flux uh, set of controllers are componentized. So they do one thing and they do them well. And they can be scaled uh, separately if needed. And they, uh, they, do with, they are following that decentralized architecture so that um, <clears throat> so that you can be more flexible with what you need to do. So the source controller uh, is, config is configured uh, with Flux to look at one or more um, sources, including um, storage buckets, like I mentioned before, right? Um, and those, that, is, uh, that can be configured on a specific interval as well as with webhooks. So for example, if you, if you don't change something very often and you want, uh, you may want to configure this to only the source controller to only read every 10 minutes from, um, from a chart source or for, excuse me, from various sources or for, from your Helm repositories. Um, but then you can set up webhooks, as I mentioned before, to, 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 to at least attempt to do a reconciliation from CI um, as soon as you make a change. So, but no matter what, it, and you can control the, the intervals there. Um, no matter what, you can you can have it read every minute, uh, every hour, every ten minutes, etc. Um, source control caches this information, and and uh, 
uh, sends that information to the, the Kube API, um, which creates uh, custom, resource def uh, custom resources for these definitions. The Helm repository uh, CRD, Helm, ch Helm chart CRD, which is embedded in the Helm, or excuse me, yeah, it comes from the Helm repository, and, um, and a Helm release CRD, uh, which we'll look at the CRDs in a moment. But ultimately, the Helm controller reads those CRDs and acts upon them based on intervals you set for it. So you can set this to, say, a higher uh, interval than your source controller if you wish. Um, it's, really, it's really up to you. And what the Helm controller will do is it will go ahead and apply these, uh, or, or sorry, release your release definitions from, from code. Um, also, the Helm controller, if you have the notification controller enabled, can notify you, as I mentioned before, um, by in various ways, but including Slack. So, uh, so you can set that up um, in ways that make sense for your team. So, uh, yeah. So, so what happens when you do a Flux Bootstrap? And I just wanted to to, to at least go over this diagram a little bit before I mention it. Is using, and I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. But using the Flux Bootstrap command. Um, Basically, what it what it will do is um, by default set up a Git repo for you that you can define when you run the command um, what you want it to be. If the repo is already there, great, it will just use it. Um, if it's not already there, it'll make one for you. It uh, it installs Flux components into the cluster, so um, these these controllers. It um, and you can also specify which controllers you want if you don't want others. Um, it also um, uh, imperatively adds custom resources, um, or sorry, the custom resource definitions, these here. It also adds uh, uh, custom resources as necessary for these, for these controllers to act on. Um, in both cases, it mirrors those manifests into your, by default, into your Git repo. So that from, from that point on, uh, the, the controllers, um, uh, well, yeah, from that point on, the controllers will, um, <clears throat> uh, you'll be using GitOps. So as you change your manifests in Git, from that point on, you will, you will then be controlling this. But, but a bootstrap phase needs to happen first for Flux to actually start working and looking at your Git repo to see where the manifests are and what it wants to apply. Um, I didn't yet note uh, the controller here that, that reads the manifests. I will do that uh, two slides from now. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's really but it's really important to at least have some sense of how this works so that it's not just magic to you. So or actually not two slides from now, one slide from now. <laughs> I know I said we were going to talk about Helm only and not you don't have to have any deep understanding of uh, of customize. That is still true. In order to lift and shift, in order to move your Helm releases from whatever you're doing now into Flux um, GitOps, uh, you don't really need to know anything about Customize. Here's the thing. Uh, the, the, we use the Customize controller to sync plain YAML to. Um, it did, I'm mentioning this like this because it, this often confuses people, especially if they're coming from a different place, like for example, Helm users. Um, I'm saying it seemed like a good name at the time because the, because Customize also does kube control apply, as well as its other more advanced uh, layering um, features or overlay features. Uh, so instead of having one, instead of us making, uh, separating uh, a Flux controller that just applies play and YAML, and then having a Helm control, or excuse me, a, a Customize controller that, that uses the more advanced Customize features, um, we just use the customized controller for applying plain YAML too, and people are sometimes confused about why they need to have the customized controller if they're just applying plain YAML. That is why. Um, but so just don't let it scare you. Uh, even if this image is scary, um, it, it simply works, and that is the only uh, place that we'll be um, we'll be using that today. So uh, all right, so demo time. Um, 
but is it okay if I just interrupt you quickly for sure, yes. questions that came in? Yes, of course. Um, so at the beginning, Chaim had asked, um, how would a multi-environment dev staging prod uh, helm release to the same cluster and to multiple, multiple clusters as well uh, look like in directory structure? And how can this be used with image uh, image repository and image policy. Will it be possible to expose the Helm release version in Prometheus? Okay, so so I'll answer the last question first. Um, yes, it is. It, it this happens by default. Um, Flux has uh, one thing I didn't note is is why CRDs are used in Flux. Uh, real quick, it's um, just because it's a, it's a very good and known structure. So there's a clear API and we don't have to really just have a lot of convention. Uh, like say, all your configurations are in YAML. Um, no, <laughs> we, we have a clear, it's a clear API, um, clearly defining what these fields do, just like other custom resource definitions. Um, and the other really big benefit of that is the custom resources that are based on those definitions. For example, the Helm release resource will contain all of the information about the actions that happen with that custom resource. So its logs or its, uh, its information about the events and its logs automatically um, get, have integration with Prometheus if you've got, if you've got that set up in cluster. So if, you've, if, if, you're, if, if Prometheus is already monitoring your custom resources um, as the default installation will, you've got it. Um, and then the, the question right before then was, uh, how do you set up a, a repo um, directory structure for multiple environments? I, I am planning to, to, uh, to show a simple version and then describe how you would modify that for multiple environments. So um, thanks. The, the first version, yeah, the first version is going to be, um, that I'm showing you is going to be, um, uh, sorry, how do I say this? Oh, the pattern where you have your environments as clusters. Some people have environments, certain environments as namespaces within clusters. You know, for example, the first one is you've got a, you know, a, a shared uh, dev cluster that you use with, you know, something, something like Tilt or Octeto. Uh, you've got a staging cluster that is part of your CI and you've got a prod cluster and they all are separate clusters. Or some people have set up a prod cluster and a non-prod cluster and the non-prod cluster has the various environments separated by namespace. So, um, but they're really, it really is just, a, your, your directory structure really just depends on that. And I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that in just a moment. And then one other quick question. And I think that's the only one that come, came in and I am also linked to a discussion about this uh, Helm release chart version Prometheus Grafana. So if you want to check that out in the um, chat, please do so. Not you, Scott, but everyone else. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, and then, so the other question was Helm rollback. Um, will rollback the previous state of input um, YAM, values.yaml? Uh, if it does not, then do we need to use Flux? Let me just make sure I understand the question. Is it, so, so is the question whether Helm rollback will then write back to, to Git if that information is rolled back? Yeah, I guess Sebastian, if you, if you want to clarify that, uh, the question that came in as Helm rollback will roll back the previous state of input values.yaml question mark? If that does not, then need to use flux. So I don't know if uh, maybe I think I may we know back what you mean by that. But if, if you want to, Stacey, are people allowed to speak during this? Can you unmute? Them? No, I can't. Oh. I, yeah, I can't unmute people. But That's yeah, okay. if you want to, if you want to clarify in the chat, that would be great. Um, yeah, you can clarify. Me. I can address it real quick, and if and if I don't address sure. it, feel free to clarify more in the chat. Cool. Uh, so yeah. Um, so the Helm. So. Uh, Helm controller, the, the, uh, one of the, the, the main ideas here is that, um, as I mentioned, that your, 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 your desired state of your operations, wherever they live, and in this case, since we're talking about Helm releases, we're talking about in Kubernetes, um, 
whether it's the cluster that you're managing from or another one. Um, if, this, if, the actual, if, if the desired state matches that actual state, uh, then we are, we are just, when reconciliation happens, we say, great, it matches, nothing to be done here. If there's any drift whatsoever, either because something changed in your cluster, um, for example, uh, there was just some actual failure, some problem. It could be, it could be a failure on the part of like a cloud-related failure. It could be some other something else. You know, so, something that this something that your Helm release depends on is no longer present, um, or someone else messed it up. You know, uh, there's there's lots of different you know reasons why, right? Like something might fail. Um, uh, Flux will then detect what the detect up, oh, there was drift. And then what's the drift or what's the difference? And then try to make sure that that, that difference is, um, is reconciled. Now, uh, the, other, the other reason that drift might happen is um, whether it's accidental or on purpose. Like, so for example, if you give people the ability to do run imperative command still, they may make a change, not really quite, let's say they got back from vacation after you started GitOps and you forgot that they still had credentials to this cluster, right? Uh, they make some Helm change and, uh, and their Helm change looks great. Uh, you know, your, your configured interval passes, let's say it's five minutes and, uh, or 10 minutes or whatever, and, um, and their change is all of a sudden reverted back to what it was and they're, they're curious why. Um, it's because Helm, it's because the Helm controller reconciliation loop kicked back in. It was, it's, wasn't paused. And that, that change that was made in the cluster was not exported into that person's local Git repository and then pushed to Git because um, they didn't realize, right? Uh, um, uh, another reason maybe for drift detection, maybe that it's completely on purpose, purposeful, and that you have, this is the most common use case once you actually start using GitOps, is that you have made your change in your source definition and you've pushed it to your your version control system and uh and now in the next and now in the next reconciliation loop flux helm controller says hey uh there's a difference between your definition and what's running in the cluster and then it attempts to resolve uh, reconcile to what you have in your your desired state definition um that's a little bit of a precursor and your question was about helm rollback i just wanted to say that first so it's clear because of that um, Flux Helm controller does not do atomic rollback uh, like you would do normally with Helm. Um, it's, it builds in a feature for that with the reconciliation loop, if that, make, if that makes sense. The idea is that you define your source, your desired state in source code, in version source code, and depending on your how you configure how often that reconciliation happens, or whether there's a webhook to to try to trigger it before, in be in between that, um, either way, uh, the the rollback idea is, oh shit, I need to roll back. Excuse me, <laughs> I need to roll back. Uh, I'm going to change that in Git and roll it back. So that's that's um, that that's that that's how that generally works. And if you need that to be automated. Um, I suggest looking at Flagger for helping with this. So I don't really cover Flagger in depth here, but it has, what I mentioned in the beginning, is more robust ways of doing um, uh, traffic shifting based on certain things, certain conditions, for example, health checks. Hope, hope that helps. Um, awesome. Thank uh, you. Oh, I should also mention retries. When I, when I said there are retries earlier, this is related to this context. Um, the Helm client, if it fails, it will do a rollback, right? There could be various reasons it fails. With Flux, it doesn't do that automatically. You can set your number of retries or your retries policy. So you don't have quick and automated rollbacks unless you want it to be, unless you want um, that. I hope that helps. <clears throat> Was that the other, the main other question? Yeah, I think that's good for now. OK. Thanks. No problem. Um, because there are some other slides, I think I've gotten a little, uh, I've gone a little long on this. So I'm, I can certainly show you on the command line. It, it works exactly as this, as this setup happen, 
as the setup shows, because um, I just made this just today, again, based on what I had already set up. Um, and uh, and I'll, you know, like I said, I'll link to this at the end of the slide later, but excuse me, at the end of the slides later. But um, but this is this is how you'll do it, and, and I'll show you what it will look like. And and this is part, part of that question of Git repo repository structure for multiple environments. So um, I'm going to assume for now you've got your you've got Flux and a kind cluster locally, just because it's the easiest way to the fastest, easiest, and cheapest <laughs> way to test this. Um, you don't have to. You know you can uh, you can use um, any uh, cluster for this, but you can also do it with kind. So the first thing you want to do, um, there, there are documents on how to do this in, in the getting started guide in Flux, so I'm not going to go over this a lot, but basically you need a personal access token if, for this example because I'm using uh, GitHub. Um, you just want to make sure it's got repo scope, and then you copy your access token to your buffer, copy buffer. Make sure to export that. Um, so, so Flux will automatically pick up on your GitHub token. And then uh, anyway, create a cluster. It takes, you know, depending on your hardware, it takes less than 30 seconds. And here is what a simple Flux bootstrap looks like. Um, I have, um, sorry, ignore my make directory here. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, you just flux bootstrap GitHub. What this does is it bootstraps both your uh, custom resources in your cluster and um, uh, uh, and ultimately um, in your in your in your Git repo. So um, yeah, could you increase the size of this screen. Oh yes. It's a thank you. Is that no problem? Thank you. I think that that's better? better. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. okay, great, great. Sorry about that. Um, okay, great. So, so uh, what I wanted to mention is that, like, in terms of directory structure, I'll give a few examples. And I know we only have six minutes left, so please put your questions in the comments if there are more. Um, I don't want anybody to be left out. And also, if we don't have time to get to them, that's okay. Um, we'll we'll follow up with you afterwards um, and make that available in, in the um, in the Weave uh, user group channel, Slack channel. Um, so in any case, the more complex your organization is, the more complex your directory structure and patterns are. This is true even if you're using just no other tools but plain YAML manifests for Kubernetes. Um, you generally want that to, to be the case. <clears throat> so I can't give you really a gold standard because there really isn't one, but I can give you some examples. Um, and it's really important to note that Flux is not at all opinionated about how your directories are structured in any way. Um, it really tries to be as flexible as it can be to accommodate all these, all the different um, simple or complex directory structure patterns that you might have that match your organization um, access needs. So, um, so, so generally, a, a simple Flux bootstrap command uh, for GitHub is you pass the owner name. Um, I'm going to say it's personal. So it's not for an org, and uh, I made you know a a, a Helm repository or you know a Helm repository name, um, or rather this name, <laughs> and uh, and you can specify a path. And what the path does is that that shows that tells the Flux Bootstrap command where to place the the manifests um, <clears throat> that Flux it, that that run that define how the flux system should be run. So, for example, um, you can just have it in the root of your directory, or in this case, I put it in clusters dev. And what that will look like is I'll have a top level clusters directory, and then I can have dev stage prod. Um, and then within those, I can have different setups because I may want some of my definitions of how flux runs to be different per cluster, whether it's time, uh, whether it's scaling, time intervals, things like that. Um, it automatically populates that, um, and I can sh I can show you just an example repo of how that works in a moment. But um, uh, in any case, it does all these things, um, and um, it sets up a deploy key and all this other good stuff. Uh, you, it, it, there's no magic; it tells you exactly the command tells you exactly what it does. 
Um, <clears throat> so if you want to do clean up after the fact, you know, have a, have a ball. Um, then uh, the next step that's really easy just in this getting started is just, you know, uh, go ahead and go to wherever you want your, your, your repos to be um, and, um, and get clone what was just created by Flux Bootstrap. So this is what this directory structure looks like because I had specified, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the person who asked the question about directory structures right now, but, um, but you know who you are uh, and anyone else interested in this too. Um, and since I specified this path uh, as clusters dev with bootstrap, um, it created those, uh, the flux bootstrap command created that directory structure in my git repo for me. And it created uh, a namespace directory flux system, which is the default namespace. You can change the namespace you want to install this in, uh, various flux related things in, but um, this is the default. And um, <clears throat> it, it, uh, it, it's, it creates the um, GitOps toolkit components and the GitOps toolkit uh, sync information and a customization file. I will show you briefly what that means. And again, this is really for now just for plain yellow manifests. Um, um, oh, here we go. Um, so here's a, uh, just another uh, example of Flux Bootstrap test. Here is what the customization file looks like. It really it creates this for you. You don't have to even know how to use it, but it's important to show that it it, it will that. What, what the customized um, uh, controller will do is apply these plan YAML manifests in the order that you specify them. So it's the components and then the sync, and this is what they look like in general. You don't have to read them all right now, but, but uh, these are the various custom resources definitions that we need, um, uh, and really everything we need to run the Flux system. This is, um, excuse me, setting up the information about your Git repository itself, and and uh, and how and how the customized controller should look at it. Uh, this is for the source controller, the Git repository, and this is for the customization CRD that that tells the, that plain YAML manifest application controller um, or apply controller, which is called customize, to go ahead and do that thing. So what this means is from this point on, oops, yeah, from this, from this point on, um, you are doing GitOps. Nothing has really happened yet because you've already, you've already implemented it in the cluster, but you're doing GitOps. Um, super quick, because I know we're just about out of time here. Um, you, you, you use, I'll just, show, I'll just tell you in summary, you use the flux commands to create custom resources that then manage your Helm, uh, your Helm um, repository and your Helm releases. And from that point on, every change that you make in your cluster uh, makes those operate. Now, if you wanted to ask, to answer that one question real quick, if you wanted to um, structure your applications within teams that are based on namespace, you can then tell, rather than exporting this information just into your cluster root, you can export it into another namespace, make a namespace custom resource, or excuse me, make a namespace resource, have customized apply that, uh, and so on, and just um, go from there. So, um, yeah, so I I wanted to get, am I still in presenter mode? No, I'm not. Well, in any case, um, I, I won't wrap it up because I think you you now know how to have a good start moving your Helm releases from Flux CI to CD, or at least an intro on how to do it. Um, you don't need any special knowledge of Customize or other tools, although you may want to use them later because they solve some good problems. Um, you should have, understand a little bit about how the controllers work. And uh, also wanted to make sure to give thanks and props to everyone. So Allison Dowdney for helping me with slides uh, initially. Um, Hida, Lee, and Kingdon for helping with some of the demo stuff. Um, obviously, thanks to the Flux maintainers as well, Helm maintainers, um, and for you. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, I think we got most of the questions. There might have been one hanging out, but I'll, we'll follow up via email. 
uh, if we didn't get to something. And just a reminder that we have two more sessions coming up booked in April. Uh, Flux 2 on uh, Azure with Lee on the 5th of April. And then on the 19th, um, Allison will be covering uh, setting up webhooks, uh, notifications, alerts, and webhooks. So please come back and join us for that. Thanks so much, Scott. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Take care.